Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Amelia, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. Um, and uh, just as a brief intro, can you sort of give us a little bit of a background about yourself and, and what what current work you do? Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me. Um, so currently, I'm a professor of international commercial law at SOAS, University of London. Um, I came into academia from the world of legal practice. I used to practice law in Nigeria. I got bored of practicing law and came back to school, did an LLM at King's College and a PhD at Queen Mary and then started teaching. After my PhD at Queen Mary, I got um, a job as a lecturer at SOAS University of London. And then, um, yeah, I've been at SOAS for 13 years now. Uh, that's, that, that's fantastic that, that, you know, one of the really sort of um, refreshing things for me is, is seeing, you know, um, academics who are from Bain backgrounds, you know, standing out in, in academia. One of the things that stood out to me about your work was the fact that you look at this um, sort of the, the concept of arbitration in Africa. And it's something that it, you, I mean, the, the reputation that is projected about Africa in, in the Western world is that, you know, it's, it, it, it's I, I suppose, corrupt and, and there's difficulties and that sort of stuff. But it's really refreshing to see that there is, you know, internal processes of arbitration and stuff like that. So what drew you to sort of research in this, this aspect of, of law? Exactly what you said. It's the narrative. So remember I said I come from the world of practice. And so I used to live in Lagos and I know that Lagos is not anywhere near the sorts of narratives that the, me the Western media at least tries to portray. And so when, um, with all of that, I kept saying to myself, this is, I have an opportunity to dig a little bit, to look at this and do some empirical work that would at least objectively uh, uh, either uphold what has been said or at least challenge some of that, but scientifically. And knowing that the narrative is very different from what I know as a practitioner. Uh, that was one of the things that really encouraged me mm. yeah, with my research. And then the second thing is uh, quite close, which is uh, I attend conferences um, and everybody, you know, people keep talking about the continent, arbitration on the continent, as to don't even try it, don't even go there. And when you challenge people and say to them, okay, tell me your own experience. Mm -hmm. It becomes people start mumbling and not everybody has had a bad experience. And maybe what people define as bad experience, maybe it, maybe it might be that, oh, it took forever to get from the airport to, to the hotel. Okay, fine. But when you got to the hotel, did you have a good time? Yes. Um, and, you know, you hear things like, oh, I was surprised that, that there was internet connection. And you go, hang on. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. Do you think, uh, yeah about the continent. So it was just the negative narrative. And I think it was important. And I think that's what the contribution that my work has done is being able to show that again, it's a question of perception. Mm. It is what you perceive. It is not what you have experienced mm. and that there's a disconnect between perception and the reality that is on ground. That doesn't mean that there are no problems or, or challenges uh, in various uh, mm -hmm. countries of the continent. Well, that's a really, really interesting insight that, that there's this divide between perception and experience. And I think one of the things that I, I struggle with, um, especially, is when you, there's this narrative or this sort of attitude when, when discussing Africa and the Middle East and certain other countries, uh, or regions of the world, 
in the West that when, when you talk about these areas, there's almost this like, um, there's, this, there's this feeling that there's no benefit of the doubt. Whereas if they're talking some, about a country like Sweden or Norway, automatically there's embedded in the conversation a benefit of the doubt, no matter what happens. Like, oh no, they're all right. Yes, yes. And, I mean, it's, it, that's, look at what's going on in the US with the election results. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Trump and his team not accepting the results uh, and then, you know, behaving the way they have behaved. Mm -hmm. If that was an, an African head of state, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, that's what, that's what they normally do. But yeah. I think what some of these incidents have shown is that some of these things are human. Mm -hmm. You know, they're different human beings everywhere. And... Um, it's a, it's a little gratifying, actually, to see that and to, to basically see how maybe that would help with the narrative, with people understanding that there's, there's something called human nature, which mm -hmm. we all have, and, and, and there are other systemic uh, issues. Uh, one of the things that you pointed to in, in um, sort of in the previous recordings about um, your work is that, you know, it, there's this sort of forced approach. It was a colonial approach to embed a system into Africa, and obviously that's a that, that's problematic given that Africa has historically, like pre-colonial Africa, was a place that was sort of, you know, dominated by tribes and kingdoms, and people practice things culturally uh, in a completely different way. And now when you juxtapose that with like the, U the, the UK, for instance, the UK has a very rigid structured legal system where society doesn't really, um, or the community rather, not society, the community doesn't really contribute to it. So you, one, of your, one of the things that you said is that as, as Africans or as African states, people shouldn't discard the pre-colonial sort of um, practices. So talk us a bit through that and, and what, what is the current situation in Africa? Okay, so, so pre-colonial Africa, we did not have the concept of states. So the map of Africa that you would see today was not what it was pre -colonial, in pre-colonial times. In pre-colonial times, we had communities, mm -hmm. we had empires, we had kingdoms, but uh, and what the uh, what colonialism did was that it brought with it the concept of statehood because really the, the concept of statehood is still relatively uh, a new concept in the scheme of things and it brought that with it and that's why we have loads of artificial borders across the continent but what it also did was that the colonialists came with their own laws. We did not have formal legal systems. We had laws, we had practices, we had our own customs that governed the way we, 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 we lived our lives. And so just in any, in any relationship or in where you have a dominator and the, the, the person or the people that are dominated, the, the dominant uh, party comes and forces, comes with their own laws and their own way of doing things. And so we sort of look at that as a question of legal transplantation, where mm -hmm. they have pulled their own legal system, pulled their own law and stuck it upon us, which, which is one thing, but then subjugating our own customs and our own customary mm -hmm. practices to their own foreign imposed law is it's, it's one of the, the, the major difficulties and that's one of the major things that has shaped the legal landscape on the continent. Mm -hmm. And so the, the primary dominators were effectively um, the, the French civil system or English common law. And then of course we have the, the Lusophones that were also civil law systems. And so the legal systems you'd find on the continent are pluralistic. So you'd find uh, the common law, the, the, the civil law. In one state you would have the common law, you would have 
uh, as part of the received law, you would have customary law. And Africans are generally quite religious, so you'd have one form of religious law or the other. Uh, and then all of this, with statehood, we now have statutory law, we have regional laws, we have international laws. So we have a basket mm -hmm. of different uh, laws that operate in individual uh, states, which we've sort of, because post-colonial uh, period, the, uh, the newly uh, independent African states continued. Uh, retain, they retained the legal systems, most of them uh, continued with even the language and all of that, which is okay. But for me, I think that those African states are matured enough not to discard their own customary laws. Mm -hmm. do, so then, do, you, so, do, do you think, so you're, what you're saying is, is now is the time for you to reassess because you've had, you know, since the 60s, since the independence of, of Africa, you have, you, you've, perhaps it was, more suitable to not try to review the law instantly because th these are new sort of revolutions and stuff like that. But now, yeah. you know, 60 or so years on, it's, it's time to rethink these things. Yes, it's time to, you, you we, as human beings, we, we, we take up time about this time of the year uh, to, to reflect, to just sort of see how we've grown, what we can do better and all of that. So it's time for these countries to reflect and, you know, find out whether their own customary, at least some of those customary uh, practices can be retained and upgraded really so that we don't have our own indigenous ways of doing things become secondary to and imported, uh, uh, actually, it, it imported is actually a very nice way of putting it because it's not, mm -hmm. it wasn't voluntarily mm -hmm. imported, but uh, a transplanted legal system uh, and subjugating our own customary laws. Because one of the things is that they, for, for lots of individuals, Africans, their customary practices are still massively important to them. Mm -hmm. And the example I'd like to use is something like marriage, you know, so, so your, your basic, generally speaking, African, normal African will have at least three. So they will do the traditional one, which is the most important for most Africans. They will do the religious one, and then they will do the statutory one, which gives them legal rights um, uh, uh, under the law that they can enforce. But you know, the customary law, the, the, the customary marriage or the traditional marriage, it is, that's the most important one, mm -hmm. which says something about who we are and what is important to, no, that, to us. That's an incredible, that, that's a very, very useful insight because um, it's sort of that, that meaningfulness of, of what, the, what the, which sort of customs or law um, applies to you and and obviously you know even here to a large extent you know like I've, I've been to like many African weddings of like friends and, and um you know people that I've worked with and and it's 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 very true it's always seen as that oh the, we have to do the legal thing now as if it's just you know some secondary aspects which is a very very useful insight um but I think one one of the things that I, I want to sort of go into a bit in, in a bit more detail is from a legal perspective, especially arbitration, pre-colonial times, how were disputes settled in, in Africa? Or perhaps if you just looked at Nigeria, how, how, was, it in, how was it in Nigeria? So, so, so most African communities would have very, very similar processes. So I'm just going to describe a process to you and, and I'm going to do it comparing with what we currently have. Mm. And so, so the key things to, to get out of the way is that we didn't have neutral decision makers because the chief or the old elders would be members of the family. They're members of the community. People know them. But the key thing is that the disputants, the parties in dispute had implicit trust that these are all the people, these are elders, so they would know what is right. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is that we didn't have a group of people called lawyers or attorneys. So we as in so in, in most African societies, uh, females would not have as much rights as as men. Mm-hmm. And so what you, you would find is is that a female may may not be able to speak for herself uh, 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 in, in her own dispute. And in some families, females would speak for themselves as a party to a dispute. They would say, they would sort of say what their own side of the story is. Mm. They would act as their own witness and all of that. They can also invite other people to act as witnesses for them. The other thing uh, we didn't have is that we did not have, well, because we didn't have attorneys, so a lawyer that would speak on your behalf, um, you, everybody, you needed to know what practice, what customary practice or customary law you are relying on. And it's usually a question of practice. It takes time. Over time, it evolves. Customs evolve. And so you, you present your case, the other party presents their case and you, you can ask questions. You ask the, the most beautiful thing about uh, dispute resolution in, in pre-colonial times and even now is the speed with which decisions were made. It was open, people were there, you could, you make your, you, you listen to each other and the decision makers go away and make their decision mm-hmm. and come back immediately with, with that decision. And the most beautiful part of it is that you accept, if you accept the decision, you then have a drink mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Because, it, because for, for African societies, the community is more important than the individual. Mm-hmm. And which is why we're not a rights-based society. It's not a question of my personal right, my individual right, which is very Western. It is what is in the best interest of the community. And so communal, community interest is the key in, in most African uh, communities and societies. And so the need to, to repair that fractured uh, uh, commu- communal spirit mm-hmm. is massively important. And so what then happens if you decide that I'm not happy with this decision? Well, you can appeal that decision to, you know, the chief in council or, or you know, a, a, the, a higher authority within the same community. But then you have to go through the whole process again. Mm-hmm. And and then, like to, can I ask, in, in that situation, so the, the, the decision makers, are the because deci- it sounds like the decision makers are also very, very much stakeholders in the situation because yes. they want the community to, you know, to continue to operate together exactly yes very very important and the authority comes from the trust that the, that the members of that community repose on them and for some of them is the question of birthright as well mm-hmm. so you know maybe all the uh the first uh, male child or the, the the oldest women in the family because my part of the country uh, the, the women in the family are, are quite powerful women, you know, mm-hmm. they get to, they have a lot of say on what goes on. And so, the, which is why one can make general statements because the communities differ, mm-hmm. you know. That's very interesting in, in that, I mean, one of the things that I can sort of make out from this um, description that you've, you know, so eloquently put is that um, there, it, there's, it, it's very socialistic in nature. Uh, in comparison to, for example, English law, where if you, you wanted to settle a dispute in the higher courts, it's very capitalistic in nature. You have to have money for it. Well, well modern forms of litigation now, uh, since colonial period, where we then have courts, that's what it is. You, 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 have to, you have to go to the courts. If you decide to go to the courts, you have to pay the court fees and all of that. You have to pay your lawyers. But even then, when we when we compare that with um, litigating in this part of the world, it is still a lot cheaper. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it is because ultimately, even here, it's the taxpayer that eventually would 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 um, uh, would help support that system. Mm -hmm. So, which is unlike modern arbitration, where you're picking up all the bills yourself. So the, yeah, the yeah. parties are picking up all the bills. Uh, that, that's that, that's um i think one of the things that I, I really really like about your description is that because I'm, I'm from iraq and it lends itself almost identically to how disputes are settled in the tribal world in iraq and you know as somebody that's witnessed these things happening um you know you can't help but notice that there's parties coming to a neutral sort of person and a neutral person they feel that they, they, their reputation is on the line. And so there's a, ne there's a need to, to sort of come up with a, a good decision and, and you know, to, to make sure things are, are done. And so this dynamic of like having, having sort of the reputation speak for itself, I want to ask, is, could that be dangerous also in, in sort of um, in um dispute settlement because you know you, somebody could try to be maintaining their reputation by appeasing someone so there, there are inbuilt checks and balances because most times it's not one individual that makes that decision and so so, so the, the the claimant or you know the, the claimant would have somebody the, the respondent would have somebody, you would have maybe two or three people mm. who make that decision uh, as a panel. So it's okay. very fair okay. that it is just one person. But, and then there's that possibility that you can go to a higher authority. And the higher authority is usually the particular uh, traditional ruler in council. Even the traditional ruler makes decisions with his council. In, in council. So, so I, I think that helps to a certain extent. And the second thing that also helps to, to, to check that possibility is that whole idea that what is more important is the communal cohesion, mm. the, the continued cohesion of that community, of all the family, or ensuring that everybody, you know, the peace that should prevail within that community or within that family is much more important than the, you know, than the personal ego or pride of yeah. the decision maker. And, and then the other thing is that we have what we call age grades. So, mm -hmm. so you know, people born about the same time, maybe two, three years apart, uh, and, you know, they, they, they all form that sort of group. And so where you have a decision maker who has been unjust or who has made a wrong decision, mm -hmm. he, his own or her own age grade members can approach them and say that decision was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, or, you, you know, you're not, you're no longer acting as um, a trustworthy decision maker. And so, so the community itself designs within itself some of those sorts of structures and systems to check those uh, pos the possibility. So there's no there's no arbitrary power at any point. No, there is no arbitrary power because the power belongs to the whole community, mm -hmm. and the whole community buy into the need to preserve the cohesion of that community, which goes back to, to the fact that any community is connected by blood. Mm -hmm. There is either uh, a forefather that had settled and, you know, had kids and all of that. So within that community, it's not disparate people who have no clue who the other person is, but these are people who can trace their lineage yeah. to possibly the same for, for parents or something. And so, so there is a stronger connecting factor Absolutely. than just that it's a community. Yeah. That's, 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 that's fascinating. And I think, I think one of the things, the things that I found really interesting about 
these sorts of settlements or, or like resolutions that are reached is that in, in a lot of cases, um, like in, in the case of Iraq, where, I, where I've witnessed, the, the, the person making the decision maker um, mm-hmm. contributes to the sort of the negotiation. He's not just saying, oh, he's rejected, he's rejected, I'm going to pass the law. He, he's actually saying, okay, well, would you be willing to do this and, you know, and, and enforce that sort of social um, leverage that he has? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Again, because the ultimate, the ultimate vision, the ultimate destination is let's restore peace. Yeah. Because if, the, if it's a private family dispute, for example, if the family is at peace, the community mm-hmm. would be at peace. Uh If it's a dispute between two families, if those two families, if we can resolve this, it it would make for for greater peace within the community. So so it's that clarity of vision, uh, which is why uh, I think that um, traditional dispute resolution processes are more akin to modern day, a blend of modern day conciliation. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and mediation, where the primary purpose of the decision maker, if you like, is to ensure that the dispute is resolved. Mm-hmm. So and so, instead of imposing, they they try to avoid as much as they can, as much as possible, imposition of a decision on the parties. But of course. Because if it gets to that point wherein they have to say to a party, well, you know, you're wrong and you need to bring a bottle of whatever, uh, you know, we use a lot of um, uh, distilled spirits, drinks or something, uh, then they will do that. Okay. Okay. So, so it's, it, the decision will be final. Um, so now, obviously, Africa's, Africa's you know, been subjected to forced you know structures of law and, and stuff and so people have go, gone about their lives and and arbitration through the legal system exists in africa and it's interesting because you've you've looked at it and the survey that you guys did at soas um highlighted that there are sort of uh, five or six um central locations that are now becoming increasingly used as arbitral centers. So tell us a bit about them. So across the continent, so again, we're looking at 54 different countries, they're independent. So we now have loads of modern arbitration. They have legislation backing arbitration. So 73 African countries, um, sorry, 73 arbitration institutions are on the continent. Mm-hmm. And so, 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 so we, we have, what we wanted to figure out was how active these centers were, that we, in, so, so we want to be sure that they are actually administering arbitrations. Okay. And we, we, we picked out by virtue of the number of disputes they've done and the nature of the disputes, not just domestic, but also international mm-hmm. disputes we then coded those to arrive at those top five arbitration centers as being the busiest mm-hmm. on the continent. And so arbitration on the continent is the same as anywhere else. It is very modern. It's based on legislation. And so it's, it's practically the same anywhere that you are. It's just, again, the experience of those centers in supporting the parties to go through the, the arbitration process. So does that not speak to the idea that you we should like Africa should be left to deal with its its own affairs and you know not I, I, think, well, I, I think that we've gone past that stage mm. because maybe that's something that globalization has done. And one of the things that we're seeing uh, as part of the response to COVID or where COVID for example the pandemic has kept us is we're doing lots of virtual meetings and all of that. So it's break, further breaking down the walls uh, of separation mm-hmm. uh, amongst the state. So there is access, there is access to, to all of this 
um, to, 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 we have greater access to each other. And so for me, I think that the, the continent is moved on because we participate in international trade. We are important in international trade mm -hmm. as primary producers, but we also have human, great human resources. Absolutely. And uh, we, we have lots of Africans who are across the globe in every single country you have Africans either in schools or you know working or living and all of that so so I think that what we do need to think about is not discarding what is indigenous to us mm -hmm. and pulling that into what we now have as in, as modern processes so that what is indigenous to us we can also contribute to the world and the world or other country other regions of the world can learn from us what uh what bits of what's indigenous to us but that, that's very interesting I, I wonder in those in these um sort of in these arbitral centers um are the cases all um because I know, we, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but arbitration law just is just, you know, a, a centre or court or what, what have you that attracts two participants who will both accept that this is sort of the place that is going to rule on this situation. Like, but we both have to accept. Um, relatively, yes. I, I think I can accept that. But I think to just bear in mind that what, what you've described is more institutional arbitration. Okay. Because we also have arbitration where the parties have not chosen any particular institution to support them. So they will make all the arrangements themselves. Okay. But then usually, so, so you have the, the arbitration law of a particular state mm. that would provide guidance and support to the parties. And so, for example, that um, our 2020 survey uh, look also looked at what we call the seats of arbitration. We also looked at the top five arbitration countries that act as seats of arbitration, and these were South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Rwanda, and Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. You know, and so 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 any any, any location uh, can host an arbitration and the arbitration can be conducted under the rules of an institution or just ad hoc, a mm -hmm. one-off uh, arbitration. Uh, so would, could, could it be that at some point in the, in the future we can see Africa being, you know, Africa attracting sort of um, attention for, you know, the efficiency or the, the you know, the... Oh, yeah. That, like, that's the goal. Of the arbitration. Yes, yes, it, it should. And, and, but it, it, it's one thing to be doing very well. It's another thing for people to know that you are doing very well. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in. Yeah. And, and so, 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 so we, our research should be able to present to the international arbitration community the work and the, the good work that is being done on the continent. Uh, and it's massively, for me, I think that's massively important. And in addition to that, is saying that uh, we, we also sort of do research to showcase and that um, we have qualified Africans who can sit as arbitrators. Absolutely. And they don't have to only sit as arbitrators over uh, disputes related to the continent. But that is a starting point. I mean, just in the fact that, that you guys have, have sort of established Rwanda as one of these um, countries that, that is a centre for arbitration and is, is effective at it, it is fascinating in itself and it helps sort of change the perceptions that people have of Africa and what Africa is because Rwanda obviously went through what it went through only like yeah. 20 or so years ago. Yes. So, yeah. And Rwanda that, yeah. is, a, is, a, is an amazing country. It is. It is. It is. Uh, and, and, you know, it goes back to what is possible. Mm -hmm. Because post the genocide, it's been, it's just transformed itself. Uh, and arbitration is not just on, um, on a scale on its own. 
it's part it has to be integrated into that country and so so it's it's the context of the economic development of the strong leadership of the vision of of the government and and, and the people of rwanda that they are excelling in 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 all areas and that includes arbitration so uh, let me ask you, I wonder if you can sort of help in, in terms of like providing some, some useful advice because I have these conversations all the time with friends who are from African backgrounds and, and they say they would love to be able to sort of go back or they would love to be able to contribute to, you know, the, 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 you know, the development further of Africa and the improvement of situation over there. And in, in the context of sort of changing the narrative, how do you think people can contribute? I think what we're doing with the work you are doing is part of that contribution. It's more, it's, it's an information. We need to be able to disseminate information, make that information easily available and accessible mm -hmm. to people. Because for, you know, so we talk about being in the information age, but people are bombarded with all sorts. So it, it just depends on having a counter narrative for, to enable people to step back and reflect and think a little bit. Okay, I'm hearing this one, that nothing goes on, nothing works in, this, in, in various African countries. And I'm hearing another narrative that says, but things work. And so, so at least you have a counter narrative mm -hmm. that you can begin to think about. But if all people are hearing is the negative one and there is no opportunity for them to hear of the excellent work that is happening or opportunities on the continent, then they're stopped because all they're stuck with is negative mm -hmm. narrative. That's all they know. So I think that where we are at now is showcasing, sharing using the various media uh, available to us of what is happening on the continent the okay. good work that is happening on the continent and there are lots of that, no, uh, there I, are lots of that. absolutely and i think one of the i think oh, just sort of as an extension of the continent is is your work so i i definitely urge everyone listening to to take a look at, at the work that amelia is doing because you know it's it's one thing to sort of um to to, in, to to encourage and to sort of like look at the show and, and listen and, and what have you but we do need like academics like yourself to, to, to have a presence and that is sort of remarkable and people can talk about and say, okay, well, Amelia sort of found this. And, and this is the problem that I find that we, we don't have enough of yet, where we, we don't look at certain, enough academics who are from African origins or from other origins and, and talk, with, talk about them with the same level of prestige and, and you know, um, trust that we would of other academics we're getting there you you're interviewing me uh, so so so, 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 so. <laughs> we're getting there um i agree that we don't do enough of that it's funny because since the george floyd um riots and all of that and the black lives movement um up, up in their ante uh, you watch the news and these days we're getting more black professionals on TV to mm -hmm. come and talk about, uh, give uh, expert opinion. And I sit back and I say, okay, which means these people have always been there. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, so, 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 so gradually we're getting there. I think again, it's, it's more of that. We do need uh, to do more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to, to also feed the pipeline because you know we need more black uh, BAME um, students going on to do postgrad going on to do phds entering the world of research uh, and uh, and pr producing and that's really important that pipeline is massively important so where can people find you online oh um on soas website they can find me on soas website and then I have a Research Arbitration Africa website mm -hmm. uh, that also houses and showcases uh, my conferences and my work. Are you on Twitter by any chance? 
unfortunately, I, I'm still trying to come to terms with what Twitter <laughs> is to start with. <laughs> it's, it's, a wild, it's a wild place, but it, it's, it's quite useful too. Um, but either way, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll link sorry. both of them. Sorry, I'll link the websites and, and your, the website and, and your social profile um, or, okay. or your, own, your own, sorry, um, uh, your own website onto the show so that anyone listening or anyone viewing can, you know, get straight access to it. I have a LinkedIn page, so I'm not doing badly. So LinkedIn oh, on LinkedIn. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely link that to you. Um, and obviously, I mean, we, we definitely urge these kind of sort of conversations and, and presence online because people need to see that. People need to know, you know, of the great work that, you know, African academics are doing in the UK, of Asian academics, of South American academics. Um, and just so that we can, you know, move away from this concept that, that, you know, like that has been going on for so long, which is sort of the, the white academic is the neutral place. And, yes. and we, and we want to show what, what the world actually looks like. Um, so just finally, what bit of advice would you give to um, any people who are sort of wanting to get into um, law or the branch of law that, that you, you practice, practice and, and teach? So the advice I would give is ask yourself what you're passionate about. It's really important to, 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 to figure out what it is you're passionate about. And the good thing with the, the branch of law that I'm involved in is that there are different tracks. You, you can sit as arbitrator, you can act as counsel, you can act as tribunal secretary, you can work with an arbitration center, you can teach, you can do research, uh, you can act as expert. So, which is great in any branch of the law that there are loads to do. Uh, I think that law, law, all my life I've been a lawyer. Yeah, and so that's all that I know. But uh, for me, I think that law is fascinating. I, I think it's fascinating because it gives you knowledge, but more importantly for me, it gives you the opportunity to reflect, to think, and to push uh, boundaries. And we need to keep pushing those boundaries because we're human beings. We continue to evolve. We're not static. We continue to change. We continue to grow. And that's important. Excellent. Well, I, I, I think that's an excellent bit of advice. And, and I just want to thank you again for taking the time to, to join me. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much, Hussein. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.